Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video we are doing the follow-up to the paper one prediction. This is the paper two prediction for the June 2023 supplementary exams. Now please remember this is just a educated prediction of mine in terms of what's come before, what I think is going to come up in the exam. We're not just going to study these things. These are the things that I think are going to take up the majority of the exam paper. And remember, if there's anything you see now which you are uncertain of, don't forget I have two playlists that are going to help you. I've got my grade 12 playlist, which explains all the topics in grade 12, and it makes it super easy to understand. But remember, I also have a playlist called Practice Exam Questions, which is where I go through these questions. I walk you through them, how to answer them for full marks. I show you the memo, the little techniques and tricks. And so maybe you should go and watch those if you see any questions here you are uncertain of and how to answer them. So let's get straight into the paper. Now, I want to remind everyone watching this, remember, this is paper two now. Paper two now has meiosis in it, especially for people who wrote matric a few years ago. Meiosis is now moved to paper two only, and you should be using your 2021 exam guidelines, especially if you have written matric in the last three or four years. You might not be sure which guideline to use. That is the guideline that you should be using. Using. So let's get into the multiple choice section, right? It's where you can get a lot of easy marks um, if you're well prepared. Now in this exam session, I'm seeing a lot of genetics questions, okay? It's a very big part of paper two, so of course there's going to be multiple choice. But what I'm saying is I think we really need to know a couple of the following things very well. We need to know when we're looking for genotypes versus phenotypes, especially in incomplete and co-dominance, sometimes we're not so sure how to tell the difference between those. And it's been a common theme now for it to be a more and more popular kind of question. So please make sure you know the three different kinds of dominance, the phenotype outcomes from them, um, and also how to work with the words allele and gene, because often we confuse them. They're not the same thing. And so we need to be able to tell the difference between them. The next thing that I see a lot of in the multiple choice questions is definitely some evolution. Now, evolution is a really big topic, right? Because you've got the natural selection part of evolution, but then you've also got the speciation and then you've got human evolution. So you've got these three big chunks of evolution that you need to know. What I'm seeing in the multiple choice this year is definitely going to be a bit more of an emphasis on the fossils, right? We need to know those fossil names. We need to know who discovered them and we need to know what country they were found in. Those three things are really important. A table is great to learn those if you just make a little study table. But I see that coming up and also potentially in the AB both or none. They also really like to ask it there. And likewise, knowing the names of the fossils, right? So Lucy, Mrs. Plez, Carabo, Littlefoot. We must, must know the names of our fossils as well. And linking to that, I'm going to get back to it when we get to the AB both or none, when we look at um, the different genus of hominids. We need to know those too. Now, moving into the terminology section, and as I have always said, if you are not doing well in the terminology section, you are not going to do well in the rest of the paper. It is just not possible. So a good indication that you are ready for your exam is if you are getting full marks for your terminology. For this year, I'm seeing terminology have some phases of meiosis. They love to ask about interphase. I talk about it in every video that I do in these predictions because they're so like... Um, repetitive. They, they love asking that over and over and over again. Interphase, interphase. When does DNA replication take place? Interphase. You know, um, when does the cell do its regular job? Interphase. They just love that question. And another one they love in the terminology section is the differences between bonds. So hydrogen bond and peptide bond. They bounce between those two, but every year they seem to put it in the terminology section. So you should know the difference between them um, and you should know what is the most appropriate answer. Now, a warning, remember there's no such thing as a polypeptide bond. That's a big mistake a lot of us make. There's only a peptide bond and a hydrogen bond, and that is it. Another thing that we are seeing in terminology is a new focus on types of dominance. And they like to ask like, 
perhaps the laws around dominance. So, you know, the law of segregation and the law of complete dominance. And then they like to give you examples and then say, like, what kind of dominance is this? You know, is it incomplete? Is it co-dominance? So be prepared for that as well. And then moving into the A, B, both or none questions, right? So this is where we can get a lot of marks as well, because it's it's six marks for three questions. So it should be nice and fast. Remember, the point of this question is to confuse you. OK, you have to be prepared for that. That's what the point of this is. It's to see, can you tell the difference between two words that look very similar to one another, maybe have very similar functions? Um, and it's up to you to tell the difference. Now, what I'm seeing here this year is going to be something about about the genre of hominids. <laughs> what does she mean by genre? I'm talking about uh, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, like knowing the difference between those two knowing the difference between habilis and erectus or sapien, you know, like those are all homo groups, but what are their species differences between them? So I think we need to focus on that. And as I mentioned earlier, the fossils love to come up a lot here. And lastly, um, the, the differences between the theories of evolution, they love to ask this. Um, and I'm going to speak about this a little bit more later on in this video, but they love to ask, like, what's the difference between Darwinism and Lamarckism? Because they're very similar, but you need to know the difference. Or punctuated equilibrium and Darwinism. And so this can come up in A, B, both or none, because they will give you an example. And they will say, is it Darwinism? Is it Lamarckism? Or is it Darwinism? And is it punctuated equilibrium? Now, let's get into the longer questions in section A, starting off with... A dihybrid cross, okay? There's going to be a dihybrid cross somewhere in this paper, okay? Generally, they like to put it in question one, but I think about last year or the year before, they did put it in a later question, which was quite sneaky of them because generally we have like a format of a paper of how it goes, but there is going to be a dihybrid question, okay? I've put an example alongside me over here. And it is generally not more than six to eight marks, so it's not going to take up your whole genetic section. No, you will never have to fill out a whole dihybrid. However, you do need to be pretty experienced in doing the following. You need to be able to tell me the gametes. You need to be able to tell me the parents. You need to be able to tell me the missing individual. And then their favorite question they like to ask is, if these are the parents, tell me what the phenotype of the child is. That is different to their parents. So it's like you got to work backwards to figure all of these things out. And that's why it takes some time. So it's it's only out of six marks. And I tell my learners it's six marks, but there's a lot of like labor involved in getting to the answer. So keep that in mind, but there will definitely be a dihybrid cross in some format. Then in question one, I'm seeing some kind of meiosis question. Yay! because it's quite an easy question generally, like the one alongside, you will identify phases, structures, you know, chromatid, chromosome, um, centromere. Again, those could be words that come up in the A, B, both or none section, because remember they're like very similar in meaning. Um, and they haven't asked that in a very long time. And they haven't asked a meiosis question since last year, but the year before that. So in 2021, the actual NSC is the last time that they've asked a meiosis question with the phases. So I think it's going to re-merge. Now, last but not least for this section is going to be the DNA profiles, like the one I have put alongside here. It's a classic question. They love asking it. It can come up anywhere in the paper, okay? It can be in the multiple choice section, and it can also be in question two and three. And where it is will tell you how difficult it's going to be. If it's in the multiple choice, it's like one question, quick marks, very easy. If it's later on, generally it suggests some explanation. Um, they've loved asking things like in the past, um, who is the father in this DNA profile? And then they like to ask things like, well, why can't you use blood for paternity? You know, why is it not a good indicator? And then you have to elaborate why that's the case. So be prepared. Another way that they can do this, which I'm just going to say to you, just in case it comes up, is they can also do a DNA profile on how animals are related to one another. Now, don't be worried. Don't be alarmed. 
Basically, all that is is a DNA profile identifying which animals are more closely related to one another. So unlike a paternity test, which should be 50 mom and 50 dad, it's more similar actually to a forensic test. In other words, we've got to see which of the organisms have the most bars in common. And that will tell you who is more related to who. You know, is a deer more related to a zebra or an impala? That kind of question might also come up. Um, it's a difficult question, but these new examiners, they like to ask new and exciting questions. So we need to be prepared for that. So let's get into question two and three, the longer questions. Now, at this point, I think we all know there's going to be a DNA question, right? There's going to be like a structure. And then there's going to be like a translation transcription. They haven't asked translation in a while. So I'm thinking we're going to go for a translation question here. And they're going to piggyback it with a mutation question, right? So they're going to change um, the codons, the letterings. Um, and you need to make sure that it actually has changed something. And what I mean by that is different codons can code for the same amino acid. So you can have four different codons with different letters, but they all make the same amino acid. So just double check that if the change they have said has happened, does it actually make a new um, protein? Or is it still the same protein? It's just a different codon, but same amino acids, same anticodons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You really need to double check, okay? Make sure uh, before you answer that question. And they do like to ask you mutations. It seems to be a new theme and a new common question, and we need to be prepared for that. Now, the next guaranteed question is a pedigree question, okay? There is no exam that's going to go by and have no inheritance of a family in some format, okay? And so you need to prepare for the worst. Now, the end of your exam last year was a autosomal dominant disorder. There was a sex link disorder there too. And so now I'm thinking, ooh, which one is it going to be? I think they're probably going to ask you a sex linked pedigree diagram and then follow, follow that with a genetic cross of something that's autosomal. Although if they do that, it's a little more tricky. Um, and so potentially what they might do is give you a pedigree uh, about a sex linked disorder and then they'll follow that on with a genetic cross at the bottom saying if individual six and eight from the pedigree above have children with one another, calculate the chances of them having the um, disorder. And then, then that's when you do your genetic layout. So I think that's where the pedigree question is definitely um, you know, going to go um, and how it's going to look. I think sex linked um, is definitely going to show up. Now, moving on to the next guaranteed question natural selection now what example they're going to use i can't predict that one year it's camels the next year it's lizards and then the next year it's about people and tibetans and their ability to live at high altitudes and i've put that question alongside here too you need to be able to explain natural selection and you need to be able to apply it to the example that they have given on top of that, what they really like to also ask, which is also something new uh, and, and it's being more and more common, is they'll say something like, well, if this is natural selection, tell us how Lamarck would have explained it. So you know it's natural selection, but give us the alternate explanation that could have been given for this. Speaking of which, something that is definitely a new trend, I see it happening because they have to ask you an investigation question in every exam, paper one and paper two, and I mentioned this in paper one as well. The investigation question often centers around natural selection, but I think it's going to be more about natural selection today. And they're going to give you something like pesticides and herbicides becoming resistant. Um, you know, um, or antibiotic resistance, um, or I think last year's final paper was about HIV antiretroviral resistance. I think there is going to be something in today's evolution that's going to show up. Now, remember, this is also an investigation question, so we must know things like our independent and dependent variable, reliability, validity, they always come up in this kind of exam. How did you control everything? How did you keep everything fixed and the same? 
that kind of thing. This question also lends itself to calculations, and I want to remind you that maths is part of science, so they may ask you to calculate things as well, and we need to be ready for that. The next question I want to speak about is cloning. Now, last year they asked about stem cells, so I don't think there's going to be a repeat of that. Cloning this year, I think, is where it's at, but which cloning, right? We've got reproductive cloning, which I've put alongside here, and this is from a 2019 paper. Um, so it's a very, very old paper. Again, they haven't asked it in a long time, so that's why I'm thinking, I feel like this is what's going to come up. It's going to be reproduction cloning. The alternate is um, molecular cloning, which is when we like create insulin with bacteria, Similar idea here, but that's the kind of thing they like to ask when it comes to evolution today as well. They're like application kinds of questions. Now I'm going to move into our human evolution. Now I feel like we dread this section because it can be hard, um, but there are definitely some certains. You are going to get some part of the human skeleton. It's going to be the foot, the hip, the skull, the mouth. It's going to be something. They haven't asked skulls and hips in a while. Generally, they ask them with pictures side by side and saying, you know, who is the oldest, who's in the middle, who's the youngest, you know, who's the transitional species in the middle, that kind of thing. So they like to ask those. They like to ask especially about bipedalism. So if they have a picture of the pelvis, they will say, well, how does this pelvis support bipedalism? And you need to know how it does that, but determining by the, the shape of the pelvis. Um, and so I think that's where we're going with human evolution. But most importantly, I think this year, we're going to go for a question like this, which is a phylogenetic tree. And the phylogenetic tree can be many things at the same time. They could have skulls on the phylogenetic tree, and they could ask you common ancestor names. They could ask you what was unique about that particular um, group, you know, Afarensis, Africanus. And then this is the overlap now with the fossils I mentioned earlier, they can also ask you like, um, Australopithecus afarensis, name a fossil of that type. And now you need to know the fossil names or you need to know where they were found. Now, last but not least, speciation. Now, speciation often gives everyone a very difficult time in exams because, and understandably so, you have to explain how one species arised from another and it's never a species you've done and, and that's how it's going to be okay they're not going to give you animals that you've done in class and you know one year it was about the lemurs on madagascar and then the monkeys on the mainland and how speciation occurred there so we really need to know geographical speciation please i see it happening this year too reproductive isolation mechanisms. They like to ask this. They asked it last year and I think it threw everyone for a curveball. So I think they're going to ask it again because a lot of people didn't know. But remember, reproductive isolation is when organisms have different um, breeding times in the year. They have different mating behaviors. They have, so like courtship, they have different reproductive organs. Their gametes don't match up properly. You know, their chromosomal numbers are different. So I think we need to know those, especially when we're talking about speciation. And again, it could be about squirrels, lizards, rhinos, anything. They can apply to anything. Now, if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe with your notifications on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And I want to say good luck for your exams. Make sure you prepare very well. And please, the best practice that you can do is past paper questions. There is nothing that will get you more ready than doing question after question after question, but also studying the memo seeing what the memo looks like and what the memo wants. Because if you understand what they want from you, you'll be able to give them the right answer for full marks every time. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.